Fisher um, was a graduate student at Northeastern, I think now about, started about 20 years ago. And unfortunately, I have to begin this lecture on a very sad note. Uh, he died um, prematurely and very tragically last summer um, from liver cancer. Um, he was a wonderful colleague and very good mathematician. So. Uh, we miss him greatly. So, um, you know, I want to sort of go back to um, background and eventually get to the result and then um, maybe be able to say a little bit about the methods used in the proof. So perhaps I should first say something about what a measure of maximal entropy is. So I think there's a range of background in the audience from people who know more about this than I do to people who know rather less. So bear with me if I'm doing more background than is actually necessary. Uh, so let's have a flow. And it will be on a compact manifold. And, uh, and so we have a distance, uh, which will be denoted by D. And then um, you can introduce for each, big T will be five. We can try to measure the distance between two points. What we do is we watch the two points flow along, and we measure the largest distance that we see between the orbits of the points up to time big T. So we take the supremum <coughs> times up to big T of the distance between the corresponding points on the orbits. So then with that notion of distance, we try to see, we try to use this to sort of see how many different orbits there are and how fast this number grows as big T grows. So of course if you have, if you count accurately, there are infinitely many different orbits. So what you do is you introduce, you pick some epsilon that's positive, and you introduce a number in big T epsilon, which is the minimum size of a T epsilon spanning set. So, uh, epsilon spanning means that everything is within a distance epsilon of something in the epsilon spanning set, and the big T says that we're using this. So, we have this number, um, and as big T grows, well, Yeah, so what you do now is you can take, a, you would like to take a limit as t goes to infinity, except that the limit may not exist. So you could use either supremum lim sup or lim inf of this number. And then you take a limit as epsilon goes to zero and uh, 
have, of course, forgotten to, whoops, I've forgotten to take all of, and I think I have to put a one over here. Uh, but, but start that again. I want one over t log of this number. So I measure the roast rate, basically, of the number of orbits that show up as epsilon distant at some time as t goes to infinity. And this number I'll call the topological entropy. So it's the same number that Mark was talking about in the first lecture today. So we can make that definition. Um, there's also, there are other versions of this definition where instead of looking at a spanning set, uh, you can look at a separated set, in which case the more, the more points you put into us, in that case you would be taking the maximum size. Now, so there's a Let's now suppose that we have a measure mu. Uh, this should be a probability measure. And I want it to be recorded with respect to flux. And then you can define a very similar quantity, which will be called the entropy with respect to this measure mu. And I do the same thing, limit, as epsilon goes to zero, limit, as big T goes to infinity, either lim sup or lim inf. But I have a slightly different number. I now add eta, which is between zero and one. Uh, you can take eta to be a half, if you like. And what you do now is instead of having, instead of looking at epsilon span, I use eta to make a restriction. And you want to know that the union of the dt was the epsilon balls. Oh, so this should be. This number should be the maximum size of a uh, T epsilon eta spanning set. So you want it to span in the same way as before, but you don't try to get within epsilon of everything. You just want the union um, over x in the set of the balls in this metric, you want the measure of this ball to be this weight. So you only try to cover measure eta. Um, you don't try to cover everything. So this number is necessarily going to be at most the number of that. And this limit exists and defines the entropy of the flow with respect to the measure. Uh, measure to be greater than equal to. Greater than or equal to. Basically, you want to make it possibly eta. Eta, eta. Uh, I, I'm sure. I'm sure if I'm sure if I were Greek, I, the real pronunciation would probably be different again. But anyway, so you do something like that, and there is a definition a more usual definition of this in terms of partitions, which I didn't want to give. I wanted to give this one because it has the closest resemblance to what you do for the topological entropy. And it's obvious that all of these entropies are less than or equal to that one. And there is the variational principle. Which says that the topological entropy is the supremum over all ergodic measures, all ergodic probability measures, mu that you might try of the entropies. So you have that result. 
And so a measure of maximal entropy is a measure which achieves the suprema. And it's a result of, I think, Newhouse, based on work of Yongden, that if the flow that we've got is C infinity, then you always have at least one measure of maximal entropy. And so, of course, if you have a unique measure of maximal entropy that singles out a measure which ought to mean something and be of, hopefully, perhaps not uniquely interesting, but at least very interesting. Did you want to take some, some soup with, uh, for eta in between 0 and 1 here? No. no? Uh, it turns out that it doesn't matter what eta is, okay. as long as it's neither 0 nor 1. Uh, so it might as well be a half. Mm -hmm. You get the same number as long as you don't try one. Okay. One zero, I suspect, would can lead to stupid results too. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that sort of may be a slight surprise. And this definition of the measure theoretic entropy uh, was given by Katok in a uh, very well known paper in the IHES publications. Uh, I think a little over 40 years ago. So, yeah, so we will be interested in measures of maximal entropy. And uh, before I go further, I want to introduce a variation on this theme, which is to talk about pressure. Um, yeah, these notions have motivation in uh, parts of physics which I don't understand, so I'm not going to attempt to explain what this has to do with atmospheric pressure. So we have a function from the space that the flow was on. It's a real valued function and it's continuous. And we now make roughly the same definition as before. Maybe I'll put a phi down there and I'll copy out the epsilon t eta 1 and what you do now is take e, e is uh, t epsilon eta spanning as before but instead of counting the number of elements in E you have the following sum you sum over the points of the set and each point you take the integral of the potential along the orbit of the point and then you add up those exponentials. And so if you take phi identity equal to zero, you're redefining entropy. Um, if phi is identically zero, this integral is zero, this is one, and you're counting the number of points at the set. So, but you can make this definition for any uh, continuous fit. And then you can do the same kind of things. You get uh, a pressure of phi with respect to the measure, which turns out to be the, ent the entropy with respect to the measure plus the integral over x of phi with respect to mu. And then you get topological pressure, the pressure, and this is the supremum over all mu of the measure theoretic pressures. <coughs> and again, if you have a C infinity flow, uh, the supremum is actually achieved by what you'd think would be called a measure of maximal pressure, but is in fact known as an equilibrium state. Uh, because that's what they have in the physics. Okay. So that's the general background. And now I will talk about uh, rather particular flows, very similar to the ones Mark introduced. Uh, you described geodesic flow for a surface of constant negative curvature. I want to think about variable curvature. So for me, the geodesic flow is defined by the picture where you take a vector, it defines a geodesic gamma v, you go for time t, and your vector has flowed along the geodesic. And the algebraic version that Mark gave is 
in the context of a surface or manifold of constant curvature. So we have the geodesic flow. Uh, so x is going to be the unit tangent bundle. M is going to be a smooth manifold. Let's first of all have curvature negative. This is the classical context. So in this case, uh, on Ft, the flow is the geodesic flow. So this is the sort of motivational example of an anosal flow. When the curvature is negative, this is an anosal flow. And you have the splitting of the unit tangent, of the tangent space of the unit tangent bundle into an unstable sub-bundle, the tangent space of the orbits plus the stable subspace. And I can draw a picture of what the, say, unstable subspace is tangent to. I'll draw the picture now because when I come to non-positive curvature, I will be able to say that we don't have an anosov flow anymore, but you can still draw the picture and use that to explain what these bundles are. You won't necessarily get a sum anymore, but the definition of the bundles will make sense. So I've got my unit tangent vector. I lift it to the universal cover. There is a geodesic. You can draw a horosphere. Uh, in other words, you can think about all of the geodesics which are backwards asymptotic to the lift of the geodesic for V. And if you look at the unit normal vectors to the horosphere, that gives you a submanifold and the tangent space to the this is a submanifold of the unit tangent bundle. This guy <coughs> E unit V is the tangent space to that submanifold. So that's we have that set up. And then there is a potential that people like to look at that is very relevant to the dynamics of the Inosov flow. And for reasons that I don't entirely understand, this is called the geometric potential. And what you do is you look at this unstable subspace, and it is going to be expanded by the derivative of the geodesic flow. So volume in this subspace is going to be expanded. And you look at the exponential rate at which this expansion is happening. And because you usually want to take minus this rate, you build the minus sign into the definition. So it's actually minus uh, limit as little t goes to zero of log of the determinant of the derivative of the flow at the the potential at V. So this is measuring the, it's minus the exponential rate of expansion of volume in the subspace. So in case of surface, your measure the volume is just the length along the horror cycle. So you have that set up. And then um, you can investigate uh, the potential for multiples of this, sorry, the, the, the pressure for multiples of this potential. Yes, I'm pretty sure I did. I tend to either forget that or, or I forget to take a logarithm. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, we can look at the map Q goes to the pressure of Q times V. So if you do this in general, for sort of any potential, you're going to get the graph of a convex function. The graph is going to have to look something kind of like that. And the reason for this is the variation. There are two things that go into it. One is the variational principle, which says that the that the pressure, the topological pressure, 
is greater than or equal to the measure theoretic pressures. And the other thing is, what is this? Well, it's some number. Just the entropy for mu uh, plus q times the integral of phi d mu. So this is a, well, I guess technically it's an affine function of q. So you get some line associated with each measure mu. These lines all lie below this graph. And the variational principle says that the graph is the envelope of them. So for the particular choices of the flow and the potential that I've got over here, there are classical results of Bowen, Franco, I suspect also Ruiz. Um, I should really look up the history more carefully than I have. You probably know it, Mark. What are you going to say? Ah. Well, so I'm going to well, start by drawing a picture. Uh, we have the topological entropy for the geodesic flow on the vertical axis. The horizontal axis is the Q axis. Um, this just measures the pressure. We have the number one here. And now I've got to draw a convex curve, which I think I'm achieving, that goes through that point. And we get, in fact, a really nice convex curve. This curve is, in fact, a real analytic. Uh, I'm not going to go into, certainly not today, into why this is real analytic. But what is, what's really, what I'm really interested in today is that for each Q, there is a unique equilibrium state. Equilibrium state. times our potential. And the fact that we have a unique equilibrium, the fact that we have an equilibrium state says that the line corresponding to that measure is going to be a tangent line to that convex curve. Let's try drawing that in yellow. And the fact that there's only one such equilibrium state means that the curve is smooth at this point. So you get this nice smooth curve. Uh, the fact that it goes through this point is no surprise, because if you put q equals zero, your, the pressure is the entropy. It's a little more surprising that you get one as the q intercept, and that comes from the Pearson integral formula. So the topological entropy, because of the real inequality, the entropy of the flow with respect to a measure, is less than or equal to the integral of the sum of the positive Lyapunov exponents. And you get equality when you have a smooth measure. And there is a inver smooth invariant measure that's ergodic in this case. It's the Liouville measure. And so the fact that we get one here is because uh, the integral, uh, this integral is exactly cancelling out the entropy. So you have a picture like that. And this works um, not just for geodesic flow, but for velocity flows as well. So that's sort of the picture of, this is the sort of ideal world for this kind of study. It really works the way you want it to. to. And then um, you, people have started thinking about what happens if the geometry isn't <coughs> ideal. So it's no longer negative. So you could move to thinking about more positive curvature. And I guess that was first the first question we thought about was whether the geodesic flow, well the geodesic flow is no longer a loss of uh, maybe I could just draw a picture of a surface. Uh, Which the geodesic flow is not an oscillant. Uh, yeah. Uh, we, we have two handles with negative curvature because a flat cylinder in the middle. And it's quite clear that there are orbits of the geodesic flow that go around and around. There is no possibility of hyperbolic behaviour there. 
So this is a non and also geodesic flow. Um, there was a question of whether the geodesic flow is still ergodic in a picture like this. For this picture, the answer is yes. For all known examples of surfaces with non-positive curvature, uh, well, we have to have genus two because we are not interested in a flat torus at the moment. Um, it is still hopes that the geodesic flow will be always ergodic at the curvature is uh, non-positive. Um, I am not the only author of a paper which asserted that this was a fact. Um, all of those papers ultimately used the same argument which has a gap in it. Um, and so if you, if you throw away the orbits along which you do not have hyperbolicity, you get an open invariant set. The geodesic flow on that open invariant set is ergodic. And then the question is whether this set of singular orbits along which there is no hyperbolicity has Leopold measure zero. And that's an open problem. Um, in this picture, the only fair orbits are the ones tangent to those circles. So it's clear you've got which is zero. But uh, who knows what the general picture looks like? Um, I'll probably ask this question at the problem session on Wednesday. <laughs> uh, well, there are people here who know methods like um, uh, the um, microlocal analysis, which I think have not been exploited in this context. So maybe there's somebody here who can help. Maybe there are several people. Anyway, so we will move on from that and try to sort of pursue what, uh, well, the analog to what we've got here. So you can think also in higher dimensions, but I think in the interest of time, I will skip higher dimensions except to make the occasional remark. So let's think about a surface. Uh, I would have genus rather than equal to two, and I want to have at least one singular orbit. So an orbit along which there is no hyperbolicity. And for the geodesic flow in a surface of non for a surface of non-positive curvature, it's very easy to explain what a singular orbit is. It corresponds to a geodesic along which the curvature is everywhere zero. Uh, so as soon as, you, as soon as you see even one point on the geodesic with this negative curvature, well, then you get an interval on the geodesic with this negative curvature, and then the orbit's no longer singular. So I want to assume that there's at least one singular orbit. If there are no singular orbits, the geodesic flow is still a NOS of and we're essentially back in the classical world. So what can you say in this setup? Uh, well, there's a paper, I'm one of the authors uh, of, whoops, I should, should not skip over the Kleiman paper, uh, Todd Fisher and Dan Thompson. And so what we can show is that for Q uh, strictly less than one, there is a unique equilibrium state for Q times phi. And so the picture that we get is similar to the one that you get in the classical case but not quite the same. We have... We still have topological entropy. We have one. We have this convex graph. And then it goes horizontally. And this picture was already in a paper with... Uh, uh, with Catherine Guilford. And back when Katrin and I worked, we did not know the result about there being a unique equilibrium state. 
So for this part of the graph, all we could say was, well, it's convex. We did know that there was a tangent line here, uh, because there's a result of Kniepa uh, from about 2000 that there is a unique measure of maximal entropy for the geodesic flow. And that result actually works in the higher dimensions as well, as long as you're talking about geodesic flows uh, which have what's called rank one. So you have non, you have you have orbits of the geodesic flow along which you do see hyperbolicity. Uh, and yeah, the what happens here is that you get a phase transition. And so the you can take the uh, Liouville measure and restrict it to the regular orbits, and that will give you zero here. And when you're out here, what you can do is find the set of singular orbits um, is a closed invariant set. Take any measure that's supported on that. Um, there will be no entropy for this measure, and the, um, the geometric potential phi is also zero. So the, you get zero for the, for the pressure with respect to that measure. And the real inequality says that for any measure, the pressure is less than zero. So that's why you get this horizontal line. And you can actually show that there is a real angle in the graph here. And so, so that's the situation for non-positive curvature. Now I finally come to surfaces with caps. So let me start by drawing a picture of a cap. Uh, what you may make, maybe I'll talk first about the motivation for it. So if you have a surface of genus greater than or equal to two, you can put a metric of negative curvature on it and get ergodic geodesic flow. Uh, try this for a sphere and you've got a problem. And the gauss bonnet theorem does rather get in the way. And so it was realised that if you wanted to have an ergodic geodesic flow for a metric on a sphere, you somehow needed to create a sphere with negative curvature as best you could. So at least you have to sort of hide the negative, sorry, the positive curvature, which must be there in places where it doesn't make any difference. And so the first picture of this nature, there was a picture by Simon. I hope I've got the right number of each letter in his name. Uh, similar pictures were drawn by Victor Bangert and uh, Dima Barago. So you just take, I'll draw the abstract version of the picture. You take a pair of pants and you just add hemispheres. And you've got curvature minus one here. Nice. This is the exact, this is great for producing a got of the geodesic flow. <coughs> And when a geodesic uh, flows along into a cap, it goes around, comes back out at the antipodal point at the same angle to the boundary. And you can actually remove the caps and identify opposite points on the boundary circle and work out that you're looking at essentially a geodesic flow on something with hyperbolic geometry. So you get ergodic geodesic flow. So people looked at this picture back, this is uh, about 1985. And the metric is not smooth. Right? The metric is not smooth. And informed speculation at the time was that this long smoothness might be crucial mm -hmm. uh, because there are pictures in billions of the stadium. And the curvature of the boundary has a discontinuity. And that discontinuity is essential for producing the ergodicity. This turns out to be a false analogy. And you can take this picture and smooth it in the most obvious way. And the ergodicity of the geodesic flow persists. So let me just take one of the caps. You preserve the fact that you've got a closed geodesic. Your and then your cap, you want to preserve the rotational symmetry um, because 
that makes everything much easier to think about. There are some results where you start with the rotationally symmetric thing and do perturbations, but the, but the understanding comes from the rotationally symmetric case. Uh, and then the curvature is equal to zero on that boundary geodesic. The curvature increases as you go up in my picture. So it's immediately down here. And so if you have a surface with negative curvature, except for caps of this nature, the geodesic flow turns out to be ergodic. And this was proven by... Uh, uh, there's an independent proof by Dima Barago. Uh, so that's very nice. Uh, so then the question, you could start to ask about the equivalent of these kind of pictures, and we still don't know, but for the uh, first of all, um, around 2015, uh, Bryce Weaver gave a construction of a measure of maximal entropy for this kind of geodesic flow. And he used that measure of maximal entropy to produce the same estimate on the growth of the number of closed geodesics with length less than or equal to big T as a nosop, uh, sorry, as Margulis had in the case of negative curvature. So this was useful. He did not show that this was unique, he just gave a construction that was helpful for the argument that he wanted to do. And so uh, so, uh, so I could say this is 2022 result, although we haven't written, we haven't fully written the paper yet. So um, Fisher, McEnroe. Um, This geodesic flow has a unit. So there's a unique measure of maximal entropy. So that's the result I wanted to describe. So I think I've left something like 10 minutes. Um, you have 13 minutes. Okay, so in other words, about 10 minutes. <laughs> in which to say something about how these kind of things are proved. And uh, at this point, I certainly depart from what you said about saying everything. I will say uh, very little, but hopefully I can say some wonderful things. So if we go back to uh, Bowen, uh, Bowen did things for diffeomorphisms. Franco was a graduate student who worked under Bowen and did the equivalent things for flows. So I'll sort of describe it in the context of flows. If I want to go about showing that I have a unique equilibrium state, there are three things that are good to know. The first one is that the potential should be nice beyond being continuous. And being nice is usually now referred to as the Bowen property. Um, obviously, that's not what Bowen called it, but everyone does now. And the idea is that there should be some pretty big positive constant and a small delta associated with the distance between two orbits is less than or equal to delta for some time. <coughs> This time can be arbitrarily big. Uh, if that happens, then if I look at the integral of the potential, which was the um, exponent in the sum that defined pressure, so I take the integral of the potential along one orbit, the integral of the potential along the other orbit, I take the difference of them 
that should be bounded. So the important thing here is that this is for any big T, no matter how big. And this works um, in the kind of world Bowen, these people were working in, because their, geodes their flow is a null solve. If I have two orbits that stay close for a long time, they do it by becoming extremely close in the middle. As you go into the middle, they converge exponentially. And then you, the Bowen property is derived by making sure that phi is held a continuous. And then there are some not very difficult estimates that bound this, no matter how big capital T is. So that's the first ingredient that you want. The next ingredient is that the flow should be expansive. And uh, I have a convenient picture here of non-expansive behaviour. If you look at those two orbits of the geodesic flow, they go along at a bounded distance from each other for all time. That is what does not happen when you have expansivity. Expansivity says that if uh, there should be some delta positive such that the distance between the orbits of two points less than delta all t implies its prime is on the orbit for x which is not happening here. So that, that's the idea of expensivity. So if I have two genuinely different orbits, they may be close for a long time. They may even be asymptotic in the future, but at some time, somewhere, they're going to be noticeably apart from one another. Uh, the other ingredient you need is specification. And specification is the kind of thing that hyperbolic behaviour gives you. Well, hyperbolicity plus some level of mixing. So the idea of specification is I have some pieces of genuine orbit, and then I want to produce a single orbit which shadows each of these pieces of genuine orbit. So I want an orbit that is close to that one, and then it goes along, and then it's close to this piece, and then it's close to that piece. And if you want to do this, uh, obviously, if I track this very, very closely, I have to be prepared to wait a long time till I start tracking the next one. But so there's a number epsilon, which measures how closely we shadow. And then there should be a big T. It depends only on epsilon. And so if we take time less than or equal to this big T of epsilon, we can get over to here and then shadow epsilon and then we can get back to here and shadow within epsilon. And in this sort of picture, the, these segments can be arbitrarily long, uh, but as the time that you need to leave what you've been shadowing and get set up for the next piece of shadowing should depend only on the quality of the shadowing on the epsilon. So that's specification. Do you remember this example? Was that in? This example does not satisfy. Uh, this example does not satisfy. Them. And I'll show you an even worse example in the last couple of minutes. So, uh, yeah, so if you have the classical setup, all of these assumptions work. And Bowen can do things that he, Bowen and Franco can do things that they want to do. So you can try to build a measure of a, an equilibrium state by finding suitable pieces of orbit. You can then, suitable orbit segments, you can then connect them up into one orbit. 
and you can make arguments that if you had two different equilibrium states, you could sort of select things from each one and build something with even greater pressure. Um, that's the argument as it's written in the classical papers is rather mysterious, but that's the essence of what's going on. And there's a more recent exposition of the argument in the simplest case of entropy for, um, for symbolic systems by, uh, by von Kleinenhaker that really makes that pretty explicit. So really nice properties you can get. You can do things. And then there's the problem of what happens if you don't have these properties. And that was addressed by uh, Kleinenhaker and Thompson. Maybe I can make some, make some things here about what they did. So their idea was that you could still more or less follow the Bowen from recipe as long as these things all come close enough to work in. So you want um, the good properties on a large enough collection of what they call good or segments. So the nature of what they do is if I have any finite piece of orbit, I should be able to cut off the beginning and the end of it. These bits might be bad, and what's left in the middle is good. And good means that if I take good orbit segments and satisfy the property up here, then this works. Uh, if I if these all segments in this picture are good, I can do specification. And the expansivity works for them. And so you should be able to take any orbit segment and make a decomposition like that. So in the picture that we've got here, the good orbit segments, uh, orbit segments that spend a sufficient proportion of their, or at least that don't spend an insufficient proportion of their time out here. If they spend too much time close to the bad orbits that are going around and around in the zero curvature, that makes them bad. So that's a very brief and insufficient sketch of what you can do. And uh, yes, yeah, so a lot of the effort in the paper uh, in the BCFT paper, was actually in getting the Bowen property to work for the good orbit segments. And then, if I turn to the uh, picture of the surface with caps, um, the good orbit segments here are the ones that spend not too much of their time stuck inside the caps. Oh, I should probably explain something about the way the caps function. So when you're in, if you think about a J Jacobi field, you can think about, you only need to think about Jacobi fields that are perpendicular to the geodesic. And when you're in a surface, that amounts to having a function, which multiplies the unit vector field perpendicular to the function. And then the Jacobi equation just becomes a second order linear equation where k is the curvature at the point along the geodesic. And when you're in negative curvature, um, you've got convexity. And if your j is positive and increasing, it will keep getting better and better. What happens when you into positive curvature is that it can do that. What happens when you go through one of the caps is it does that but it does it exactly once, no matter what angle you enter the cap at. And by the time you come back out of the cap, the function is at least as big in absolute value as it was, and its derivative is at least as big in absolute value as it was. So miraculously, the caps do no damage. And as long as you've got something that is recurrent, 
even if it visits the camp, you can get hyperbolic behavior for it. And so good orbit segments are the ones that spend uh, not too much of their time stuck inside the caps. And then um, you can check the various properties. The one that caused the most damage and real anxiety at the end is the, uh, the expensivity. That expensivity was rather easy for the surfaces of more positive curvature. We, rather, we mistakenly assumed it was rather easy for these surfaces. And then we had a somewhat nasty surprise. If I think about an orbit that comes close to the boundary of a cap, I can't draw this picture very accurately. Because if it gets really close to the boundary of the cap, it's going to go around a million times before it comes back down. Maybe I should sort of lift, do some lift of it. It does that sort of thing. And then if I go in too steeply, it does that. And somewhere in between, I can get it to do that. And this end will be backwards asymptotic to the geodesic that came close to the cap. This end will be forward asymptotic. And these things go along at a close to each other. And this is the kind of picture you absolutely do not want to see when, if you want um, expensivity. And this picture necessarily happens. If you've got the kind of measure of maximal entropy that you want, almost every orbit is going to do this sort of thing. So you're, you have to get around that. The way we got around it was to uh, think about the geometry of the unit tangent bundle near the orbits that correspond to the boundary of the cap. So you have these two circuits. The boundary of the cap is a closed geodesic. There are two closed orbits of the geodesic flow that correspond to it. There's one that goes this way around, and the one that goes that way around. So I'll just think of one of them, and I'll draw a picture of, of what, so we've got the boundary of the cap, you go this way. If I've got a vector nearby, uh, there are, you can measure the height of it, uh, the angle that it's making with the horizontal, and there's also where you are around this way, which doesn't make much difference. So if you get a tangent bundle, you've got this bad orbit going along, You've got transversals to it. And in the transversals, you've got the angle and the height. And what you do to fix the problem with expensivity is to just do a blow up in this picture. Um, replace the geometry of this cross section to the flow by removing the points in the middle. Corresponds to the center of orbit and blow that up to a circle, and so the thing now looks something like that. And things that the kind of things here that are close to each other are now well apart. And so you can fix the expansivity problem that way. And then, of course, when you go back and look at specification, uh, you've got work harder than you did before, but it's still a manageable problem. And I think I've used up most of my 30 minutes, and that's a good place at which to stop. Thank you very much for the talk. So are there any questions for Keith? There you go. Are the orbits, these, these orbits which are on the boundary of the cap, are they the only Periodic orbits which are neutral? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So the. Yeah, as long as. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the six, six the one, orbits. They see only zero curvature. Yeah. And they are the only ones. They also see some negative curvature. And so if you had a closed orbit that saw some negative curvature, it's recurrent. And um, if you come back, the Jacobi field that was initially growing. 
is growing again and at the t while it went through the caps so you didn't lo lose the growth you'd already had and so you can get recurrent growth out of that so you'll get more you'll get hyperbolic behavior well, the orbits which make trouble here they're not uh, periodic as well yeah. well the you mean this this right yeah so uh, I think this could be periodic or non-periodic. It doesn't make any difference. But the trouble is really being caused by the close approach to the boundary of the cap, which is periodic. But you've just got this finite number of bad orbits, and they can be good. Uh, so, uh, that's, um, yeah, so. I mean, you have orbit, orbits which are homoclinic to this uh, periodic one. Well, they, they will... Asymptotic, asymptotic. Yeah, you won't get hyperbolicity along them, but... Um, you know, you know, you this blow up, sort of, gets rid of the, the problem. Any other question? So, I have one question. What if you consider um, the potential Q times pi in, in this case? Um, well, we haven't done that yet. It should Seems be. Like the next <coughs> yeah, step, right? um, that is a natural next step. I, um, Unfortunately, I will not be able to work with Tom on that. Uh, we should, with what, based on what we've got, at least be able to get it for small values of Q. Yeah. And that actually is what we can do in the non positive curvature case in higher dimensions. Mm -hmm. Um, the result for we have we basically prove it for entropy, mm -hmm. and then there's a, some there's something where there's an actual gap for entropy, mm -hmm. and if you choose a small enough value of Q, the gap persists. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but the result for non-positive curvature where Q went all the way up to one, mm -hmm. that at the moment is only a two-dimensional result. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know that would extend to even to dimension three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Can the measure of maximum entropy be obtained as a weak limit of uh, a sum of Dirac's on the periodic orbits? Like in the uh, so in the classical case, yes. Yes, but the in, the non, in the caps, in, in the caps the case. case, yes. Um, in the surface with caps case, I think the answer is yes, but I'm not going to stick my neck out and say it. Uh, Fair enough. If I energy, I think I'm down to writing the paper on my own now. If I have enough energy, well maybe I'll find somebody to work with and write a second paper, because I would expect the answer to be yes. All right, so let's uh, thank Keith again.